We all search for that spark which fuels our desire to fully engage in our lives. We look for the courage to experience moments where we can come alive instead of watching life pass us by. You're listening to The Front Row Factor, leaving fear and insecurity behind by exploring stories of top performers that are living life in the front row. Get ready to stand up, step up, and live it up with your host, John Vroman. Hey, hey, Front Row family, John Vroman here. Welcome to another episode of the Front Row Factor podcast. Today, I'm talking to Jake Burke, and he is the co-founder of Cure NF with Jack, which their goal is to raise awareness and dollars to help find a cure for neurofibromatosis, otherwise known as NF. And we'll get into that during the show. In the last five years, this organization has hosted many golf tournaments, tennis events, and other fundraisers. They even partnered with Cupid Undies Run, which in just five short years now, they've raised a million dollars. And they're committed that they will not stop until they have found a cure. Now, why is Jake so passionate about this? Because he is the father of Jack, the awesome 11 year old who's been fighting NF for years. We met Jack uh, two years ago when our mutual friend Helen Brown connected Front Row to the Burke family, and we became an instant fan. And the team rallied, raised money, and we created a Front Row experience in 2014 for Jack to see the world's greatest magic show. And in our interview today, we talk about that experience. Now, I will tell you, if possible, pause this recording, go to frontrowfoundation.org, go to the Experiences tab, and search under the name Jack Burke. And check the video out, we'll look at the pictures. But if you can't, you're still going to love this interview, which I want to warn you is emotional. This is very real for the Burke family, and I promise it will be tough at times to listen, and you probably will shed a tear. But I will tell you, you will be better in the end. So don't avoid this one. This is an important interview and it's an important conversation. Even if you personally are not working with somebody or supporting somebody that has a life-threatening illness, you will at some point. And this interview provides great perspective, great strategies of how to deal with life in some of the toughest moments. We talk about what you can't do in order to help. We talk about a powerful visual that would help anyone understand what it's like to walk in Jack's shoes. We talk about how you can respond when someone you know is going through a serious health challenge. What do you do to help? And we talk about how to live in the moment despite the challenges that you face. We talk about amplifying the good in order to silence what is not. And we even get some great advice from Jack at five years old that will rock your world. Now, this is a little bit longer of an interview. I think it goes about an hour and 15 minutes, but keep hanging in there. Trust me, so much good stuff keeps coming out and in more and more and more towards the end. Now on to the show, ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Jake Burke. All right, Front Row family, I'm here with uh, Jake Burke. Good morning, Jake. Good morning, John. Hey, thanks for taking time. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I'm a fan from afar of you, your family, and of course, Jack. So this would be a fun conversation today. Well, this is a, I'm very excited. This is a mutual thing, mutual admiration of society going on here a little bit, John. So thank you for allowing me to be on with you. It's uh, it's quite a pleasure uh, on a Friday morning here. So thank you. Yeah, it's Friday. Yeah. Hey, let's start off with what's good. Let's get some great energy flow in here. Want to yeah. know what's happening in your world, your family's world, Jack's world that's positive right now. Fortunately for us, uh, this was uh, a good week in Jack's world. Jack, as you know, uh, he has MRIs on a quarterly basis now due to his brain tumor, his low-grade glioma in his brain. So on Monday, we had his MRI. They do a scan on his brain, but also his spinal column and everything. And not to bury, so to bury, not to bury the lead, but basically the great news is, is that uh, he, his scans came back as stable. There's no new growths anywhere. His brainstem uh, glioma is, is stable. Uh, his left plexiform neurofibroma in his left eye is stable. So we were very, very excited about that. Um, the anxiety, or what many people call the scan anxiety um, around scans, um, I'll deal with that for the rest of my life, and that's fine, uh, as long as the results continue to be positive for us. And we don't know that, but that's always going to be the case. But for now, uh, a good week for, for the Burke family, for Jack, for Kieran F. with Jack, is that he's stable and, 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 and great. So, so thank you for asking that. Wow, that's so great. Yeah. 
And yeah. uh, you've also got uh, you got a big a fundraiser coming up, right? We do. The, the cornerstone for Cure and F with Jack's fundraising has always been the golf tournaments that we had. And five years ago, we started – five years ago this month, we started with let's try and do a golf tournament with 0.0 information on how to do that. And here we are five years later with our 13th event because now it grew into events in Washington, D.C. and one down in Florida where Jack Nicholas was. You can see over my shoulder maybe – that's a flag from the oh, event yeah. two years ago, the Kieran F. Jack golf flag signed by two legends, uh, Jack Burke and Jack Nicholas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, and uh, so we're, the, the fifth annual one is coming up here in Atlanta. We actually are putting the registration link out today. It always sells out. It's an incredible event. Um, and it really is the cornerstone of all the things that we started to do when we weren't sure what to do five years ago. And uh, so we're excited about that event and uh, the one in September down in Florida with Jack Nicholas again and the one in D.C. coming up in uh, October. So another busy year, John, for sure. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. For Front Row, we've had uh, golf tournaments in the past. Our friends at Axis Construction Management put this together, and it was an amazing day. And yeah. I know the power that they have. And, and I also know how hard they are to put together. <laughs> so I, I honor your your commitment to making well, that. Well, thanks. We got a ton of help, thank goodness, from a wonderful community down here in Milton, Georgia. Obviously, Beth and I couldn't do it without all of our friends and, and our family. So thank you for that. But uh, it, it really is all the people that step up, which is great. I'm going to add that to my my dreams while well today to fly and participate in your tournament one day that would be no yeah do that man you would you would not regret it you can pick anyone you want whether it's atlanta whether it's uh west palm beach it's not a bad destination that's right uh, yeah and to meet the greatest golfer in the history of the game wouldn't be a bad thing either and then of course closer to you is our washington dc event that this year is going to be at uh, trump national that has nothing to do with politics, so I want to say that loud. <laughs> good or bad, but uh, uh, that's where it Trump is. Right? Yeah, well, it's a great course. It's a great. It's, it's a huge course. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> hey, uh, Jake, take us uh, take us on a little journey here through your life. The crew would have already known. The front row community knows about Jack's story, and yep. we'll have set that up. But uh, but take us back a little bit. We'd love to hear it from your perspective. Jack growing up and uh, maybe take us until until now, you know, where we are today. Sure. Well, it's been a heck of a ride, John. You know, Beth and I got, got married in uh, 2003. Uh, uh, I'm glad I got that right. And Jack quick, Jack <laughs> quickly came. Go. Yeah. Jack quickly came to our lives in 2005 and uh, everything was everything was awesome. Right. I got a baby boy and he was great. He looked like my father and, you know, all those wonderful things that you, you get. And life was good. You know, Beth got pregnant again, and we were ready to have our second child. We didn't know boy or girl. Ended up Luke came along, but just before that, uh, Jack got diagnosed with neurofibromatosis. That was like you know those one of those points in your life, right? There's many of them, uh, but that was one of them that we were like, whoa, yeah, for a lot of reasons. We had no idea what that meant. We had no idea what it meant for Jack, and here we are getting ready to have our second child. And they say, well, this is a genetic disorder. Okay. Does this next baby have it or do we have it? And we, we did not have it. You know, Jack, like a lot of people that get NF, it's just a random mutation. A lot of people get it because it's inherited from their parents that whether their parents know they have it or not, in many cases, people don't and uh, carried on. But for Jack, um, it was random. For Luke, he came along fine, born in 2007 already trying to rule the world and uh, fortunately for him uh, and for us he doesn't have NF nor does Grace who came along in 2011 she really rules the world um, right now in this house so yeah that was that was the beginning of the of the Burke family as it were and as it is now with the three kids and we were trying to balance this new family with Luke and first and at the same time all these things coming down the line about Jack's condition I mean, we didn't know anything about neurofibromatosis I knew that it was uh, one in 3,000 births, which makes it more prevalent than cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, uh, Huntington's disease, all of those things you've heard of, right? That's right. You've heard of all those disorders. Yeah. But I bet before you, maybe before you uh, heard about Jack from Helen Brown, you were like, NF what now? What is that? Right. I had not. Yeah. Right. So therein lies the problem. I said, well, if it's one in 3,000, is that prevalent? This is going to be, this would be cake. You know, this is going to be great. There's got to be somebody out there, you know, and I found out very quickly that we didn't have our Jerry Lewis. You know, we didn't have anything. People didn't really know what it was. I didn't know what it was. 
and what does it mean and all those things. So we got right to work internally about what we're going to do about our son. And it took a long time, John. Um, you know, I sit here now, I do these podcasts, I put my heart out and soul out on social media. I, I document and, and write blogs about Jack's uh, issues in the family and all that stuff. But that's not how I started. We started like, oh boy. You know, we don't want to, I don't, I don't want to tell anybody this stuff. And many, many families struggle with that, I think. And then we decided that, well, you're either going to sit on the sideline and wait for somebody to do something for your son, or you're going to step up and do something. What is it? I don't know. And the first thing to do was to let our world know that we we have this battle and will you come along for the ride? And that's what we decided to do um, when we decided to create Cure and F with Jack. One of the first people that I told about Jack, whose last name was not Burke or O'Brien, was Helen Brown. She probably shared that with you. We are colleagues on the road back when I was working in, a, in the same industry, and she just asked me. Uh, we were sitting in a bar. That might not be a surprise to you, but uh, <laughs> we were sitting in a bar, and I had a, I had a bracelet on, and she asked me what the bracelet was. And she allowed me it was really the impetus of me telling the story to the world. It started with that conversation with her. So, you know, she's a special person to me. But once we decided to do that, John, then the world changed. And our world's become partially about uh, Kieran F. Jack. But the Burke family is more than that. You know, you mentioned earlier about, you know, I mentioned Luke and what our lives are about now. We've got these three kids, you know, 11, 9, and, and 5, and just uh, fill our days and our weeks and our months, like a lot of other families, with a tremendous amount of joy and a tremendous amount of angst. <laughs> at the same time and that's what we're doing we're living life and god bless luke in particular he's the younger brother that has been living with this too he shares a room with jack he knows all about nf he knows that people struggle with nf people die from nf and and but he is leading the way in, in the fight but living his own life too and he's a he is a great great boy does well in school does well in the athletic field you know lacrosse ice hockey and all that so he's he's a wonderful wonderful kid and, and a great asset to us and then of course there's gracie who has changed our world you know having two boys we wanted to find out the gender for this one uh <laughs> and, and when the doctor said yeah it's going to be a girl we we're like wow and she's been just an amazing gift for us and she'll be in kindergarten next year so the first and only year all three burke kids will be on the same bus going to the elementary school and you know look out elementary school that's all i can say that's incredible and i totally relate to the feeling of having lots of joy and lots of anxiety around uh, the family two boys and i i'm i'm afraid that if my wife listens to this episode we will be going for a little girl so i all of a sudden got some anxiety right now uh, well here's the good the news for you you have the edit button so maybe this won't make that's it right. To the cut. <laughs> that's right so let's talk a little bit about jack's day his front row experience and what that process was like for you. So again, Jack goes to see the world's greatest magic show, right? Yeah, and it was so much more than that. So that was the thing, right? Uh, the magic show, what would you like to do? And magic, and it's still, you know, two years later, magic is, is his thing, he loves it. And uh, uh, he watches, uh, there's a show on TV down here, well, it's national, but he's based here in Atlanta. The Carbonaro effect. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, but Michael Carbonaro is a magician, young kid, probably in his 20s, and he's on TV and he does incredible stuff. So the magic thing is still well and alive here two years later with Jack. But um, yeah, the front row experience in April of, of 2014 was just uh, pretty incredible. Yeah. I remember first hearing about Jack's story. It was likely from Helen. Yeah. You know, I was just immediately attached. I think a lot of people feel that way with Jack. He's, I've seen him on TV interviews. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember just hearing stories. But easy to fall in love with Jack. Sure. Um, and also easy to fall in love with your family and how tight you all are. And I remember when I saw the video eventually of the day and I watched you reading the letter to Jack mm -hmm. yeah. uh, about the the experience that was coming. I just I felt like I was right there with you all in the kitchen when that was happening. Take us back to the process leading up to the event. And so let's talk for a moment about the weeks or months that led up to that. And sure. what was it like in that process? And the way I like to link this, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, Jake, is the idea that in our charity, we have three guiding principles of hope for the future, living in the moment, and celebrating our experiences. And we just believe in the power of that. Why we do the ticket unveil is we want people to be looking forward to the day. 
Yeah, sure. So can you take us there a little bit to the uh, days or months leading up to the event? I can, yeah. I mean, it was it happened quick, John. Helen's really smart. Helen knew that if, if she asked permission as opposed to forgiveness, <laughs> that this event would happen. And, you know, at the time we had been working quite a bit We've been working quite a bit with Cure Enough with Jack and trying to carve paths to help others. You know, again, with Cure Enough with Jack, the key word in the logo is with. You know, nothing that we do goes to Jack or the Burke family. It all goes into research. And Helen would say to me time and again, you know, what, what are you doing for, as a fan? What are you guys doing? Do you have any time with all this stuff? And like, eh, eh, whatever, right? And so then she hits me with the announcement that uh, she's gone ahead and with her friends at front row and she's going to gift a, a, a trip for Jack and the family. And I said, yeah, you're not, you're not doing that. And then she said, well, it's too late. I've already done it. And so, <laughs> and if you know Helen, you know, you don't really have a say anyway, it's, it's what she wants. And, uh, and so we're similar in that way. So she played it brilliantly. And then she's like, well, you know, sometime in the future, you're going to go on this trip. And it's going to be, you know, Jack wants magic. Jack will get magic. I, I can't tell you the details. And it's going to be probably six, eight, ten months. I said, okay. And then she called me like a week and a half later and said, in the history of Front Row, they've never raised enough money in that short a time to get uh, the Front Row experience going. I said, are you kidding me? I said, and I didn't know what that meant in terms of quantity. I, I imagine that it was more than a few hundred bucks. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. I said, well, we're, we're, who's donating and all that? And she said, well, we'll get to that because you know them all. And it was just incredible. I mean, we went from we're doing this to it's done and pick a date. It wasn't months, John. And it, it, it was, in my recollection, it was weeks. And then it was, it took, it was longer between the time of, yeah, we're going to do this to actually schedule versus how long it took to actually take care of the financial end of it, right? So that was pretty amazing. And that was probably the most overwhelming thing for me because, you know, you just don't know. You don't know where people are at. And there's a million things competing for your heart and your checkbook, right? There just is. You know, I donate to a lot of different charities myself. And when you get people who you might have seen on the road at a vendor event or at a conference or whatever, and you see that they write a check for $100 or $500, and you're saying, whew, wow, that's a pretty powerful thing. And the venue and the vessel to do that was front row. You know, the reason was Jack. And taking those two powerful elements together, it was an unbelievable thing. And, you know, two years later, I still, you know, <clears throat> I, you know, I get the, <clears throat> you know, this dusty in my living room here. <laughs> I see it. I see it's floating around. Yeah, it's floating around. It's pollen. Yeah, pollen. Uh, down in Atlanta. That time of year. But even two years later, you know, in the people that still stay with Jack, people that wrote a check because Helen asked them to, but they stay with him on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram. And they always comment about the good, the bad, and the ugly that are going on with this disorder, whether he's had an MRI and I've announced that he's had an MRI and I get inundated for days from people that have not even met Jack necessarily. And it's become part of who they are. And that's just an incredible, incredible thing that happened as part of this front row thing. So the big day, you mentioned it, it's on video. I watched it again this morning. I tried to muscle through it. Is that, that big day, that event that was videotaped by our friend Dwayne Codrington, the reveal, if you would, of the trip. That was just unbelievable, the reaction that Jack and Luke had. Gracie was only three, but she just was excited that we were going on an airplane. And just bringing that all together in that moment of giving and kindness and true investment from people uh, was just really amazing for us. Um, and then, then the anticipation of actually going on the trip uh, was, was incredible. So, Jake, I want to take a quick second and talk about, as you reference the support of the people, you know, you talk yeah. about like the fundraising and the people and you have the, a friend who does videography. We call that who's in your front row as being one of the most critical elements, especially if you're fighting something in life, if you have a challenge, if you're trying to overcome having people that are supportive can mean so much. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit about what impact that's had for you? I think you did that just beautifully now. I just want to give you a chance to expand that if you'd like of, of the impact of, of the right community around you. Because I think that sometimes, and, and I'll say why I'm asking this question also, is that there's a lot of people listening who know somebody 
in your shoes and they don't know what to do. Sure. It's like somebody in your life is struggling with something. You're like, I don't know. Do I say something? Do I bring that up? And, you know, we had one person post one time that if somebody tells me this is a person who's battling for their life, they're like, if one person tells me one more time that God can give me only what I can handle, I right. would freak out. <laughs> so <laughs> I've joked around about that saying, too. I'm like, you know, I think God made a mistake. He he spelled he was looking for some other, he was looking for a, a Steve Burke or something, but he gave me his stuff because i'm jake burke and god you know this whole gives you what you can handle thing maybe that's true i don't know but there's to your larger point what do people feel like they can do yeah that's right, right. you know what do i say geez the, the kid's got uh leukemia and uh, or the kid passed away from a disorder what do you do you know what you do you just be and you bring to the table the element of yourself that can help that situation. What I mean by that, I mentioned Dwayne Codrington. He's a neighbor of mine, friend of ours. He's a professional videographer. And he brought that to the table by saying, I want to document Jack's journey. That's what we called it when he was going through his chemotherapy. And you know what I said? I said, no, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, uh, uh. And he came back again and said, listen, it's what I do for a living. But, and I know that that can help your cause, trust me. And when he said, trust me, I said, okay. He said, you get final cut, you get final decision. I'll work this thing through, and if you say to me, it's never gonna be seen by anybody, fine. But trust me. And so his talent, right? The talent that he brought to the table, mixed in with a heavy part of his heart, John. I mean, he was in the room when Jack was getting chemo one day and had to stop filming, because he was crying. So it wasn't just the videographer and his talent there, but it was the whole human. So, so he doesn't write a check necessarily because other people do that. They give their treasure because they don't have a talent that they feel is valid or they don't feel comfortable doing anything other than the important thing of funding a certain thing, right? So other people give their time. So it's the time and the talent and the treasure. And everybody, I don't care who you are, can give one or all three of those things. And every one of them is valuable and important. So the time that has been given to us by the community here in Atlanta and up in Boston, where my family is, in Chicago, where Beth's family is, but even beyond that, Matt Benson up in Washington, D.C., the founder of Cure NF with Jack D.C. tournament. You know how many people in this family have NF? None. Zero. You know how many people he heard of had NF before Jack? Zero. And then his buddies go to his tournament, Dan Allen and Pat Kelly, and they say, well, we can do better than Matt Benson. <laughs> <laughs> and so they decide to do, they don't ask me, to. They, we want to do this. And that's how, how it happened there too. And then someone says, well, Jake, do you play tennis? No. Well, I do, and I want to do a tennis tournament. So my neighbor, Christine Langlands, decides to come up with Smash NF with Jack and has a tennis tournament. But everybody can find a way to help in a unique way, but a very impactful and valuable way. And it's so easy if you really look at it from that standpoint. And the time, everybody has some time to give, even as busy as we are. You have time to give. And what does that mean? Well, some people dropped off meals. We had a meal train going when Jack was in the throes of, of his uh, chemotherapy. And so that takes time to prepare a meal. Uh, that takes time to come over and drop it off and to sit on the porch for a few minutes and say, how are you doing? And being ready for the answer, which you know is going to suck, right? It's like, how are you doing? Well, my kid's upstairs battling a tumor and he's got chemotherapy. And you know I'm going to tell you how much it sucks. But the humanity of standing there and asking the question and being able to listen and not even say, oh, well, God will hand you, only hand you everything that you can handle. Or, you know, he'll be okay. Don't say anything. Just say ask a question, listen to the answer, maybe give a hug and, and spend that time. You know, That's what really people have done for us is given their ears, lend the ears and the heart and hug. You know, <laughs> That's probably the, the thing that I try and do most with other people that I'm trying to help out with, whether it's, I don't have a lot of talent. So I have to give my, <laughs> my treasure, which I don't have a lot of either. So it comes down to time, John. That's right. Uh, I give that. I'll tell one more example. We'll talk about who's, you know, as you say, I'm, I could name a front row that would extend seven miles if yeah. we had seat to seat to seat. Wow. Um, and I could literally do that. I could name hundreds of people 
right now uh, that are in our front row. But there was one in particular. When Jack was going through chemo, 52 weeks, every week, it was sometimes on a Thursday, sometimes on a Friday, whatever it was. Every single week, my friend Jack Flynn called. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> you know? And that's going to be the shittiest phone call to make. Because you don't want to hear, right, in some ways, because it's all unicorns and rainbows. But he knows that I'm struggling and Beth is struggling and it was a terrible time. But every week, every week, I mean, without fail. And he's, you know, he's got his own life. He's got a wife and three kids. He's got a job. He's a you know, VP at a large company and people on him all the time. His burdens are heavy like everybody else. But every week. And in addition to a lot of the things he does for us, but that will be the thing that stays with me for the rest of my life is the time and the concern and the care. He never said it's going to be okay or it's going to get better. He never said, you know, well, God's given you this to, you know, all those things, all those things that people say for themselves, actually. I think it makes the person who's saying it feel more comfortable, but a very difficult situation. And I understand that. But what he did was say, hey, man. How's it going? Oh, how's he feeling? Okay, well, that sucks. All right, well, you know, you know where I am, you know, and you know where the Flynn family is, and I'll be there. And there's nothing better than that, really. So he's in the front row, his wife's in the front row, and, and so many people, John, it, it, the list goes on, you know. I'm, I'll never be able to pay that debt back, you know. Well, and the good news is they're not looking for it. Well, that's true too. That's yeah. true. Well, Jack might be. Jack. Might be <laughs> Jack Flynn might be looking for something. <laughs> oh man! Uh, thank you, by the way. That's very powerful, and that's very healthy for me to hear. That gives me great instruction. Gives me great confidence of how I could approach those situations down hmm. the road. So, thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Let's talk about let's talk about managing the moment. You know, how do you how do you find joy? How do you find positivity some, you know, in a day-to-day -day situation? How, how do you do that? How does Jack do that um, as he fights this tumors? Mm -hmm. How do you find a way to be present when maybe sometimes like, you know, the idea is you want to get away from it all. Yes. Like you'd want to try to escape and that's sort of the essence of a front row day is to to get and be present somewhere else other than your day to day struggles. Um, sure, a chance to have some relief from that and to celebrate life in that way. How does that show up for you in your life, celebrating the day or living in the moment? That's a great question. I think we learned actually from our front row experience that that's possible. That you're not running away, right? Your problems are your problems, and your challenges are your challenges, but. You can live in the moment and be absorbed in joy of life despite those challenges. And it's an effort to do that because, you know, in Jack's situation, it's a very visual thing. We don't forget that he has NF because, unfortunately, he has the plexiform neurofibroma in his left eye where it causes swelling and it looks like, it looks like Luke gave him a whack, right? So we see it every day. He sees it every day. Other people who have this disorder have bumps all over them. I mean, it's a visual disorder in many cases, not in all cases. In Jack's case, for example, if he didn't have that plexiform in his left orbital area, you wouldn't know that he had anything for the most part. So there's a continuum there that how the disorder manifests itself with people externally in addition to internally, and it's terrible. How do we live in the moment? I don't know how I can speak to Jack. I don't know how he does it. But for me, how I do it is just that you only have one shot at this. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to, what are you going to do? So I believe that there's joy every day. I mean, just stuff that everybody else does, like you do with Tiger and Ocean and everybody does with their family is, yeah, we have this thing and it's a tremendous burden and it's a tremendous scary thing and it's part of our lives, but it's not our lives. You know, one doctor said about Jack, we hosted and paid for a consortium of doctors looking at NF a couple of years ago at, at Matt Benson's golf tournament. And one thing he, he got up and he said, I know Jack Burke. He's my patient, but I know him. And, you know, Jack has NF, but NF does not have Jack. And I was like, well, you know, I thought I was pretty clever. <laughs> and I've been living in this stuff for years, and I didn't think about it that way. We went home that later that uh, week. We came home from the trip, and Beth printed it up, and we hung it on the wall in Jack and Luke's room. And we also said that, you know, NF 
doesn't have Jack, but NF doesn't have Luke either. It doesn't have us. You know, we have it. And so the joy is just, you know, watching Jack do his thing. And what I mean by that is interacting with adults and children. That is difficult process for many people anyway. But for this kid who's been doing it like this for five or six years, despite his challenges, it's just amazing to me. I get great joy when he got up in front of a room full of international sales leaders in the plastics industry who he was asked to come in and talk to them about a journey. And he got up there and just riffed. You know, he got up there with his eye. He got up there and just talked about his journey. And, and people were like, oh. yeah. And coming up afterwards and what they didn't have time or talent but they sure had treasure that day and they donated to jack and it was a pretty amazing thing that i get great joy in that i get great joy in when luke and jack have beaten the hell out of each other because i know that's the only two people that can get away with it because on the bus or in the schoolyard god help the son of a gun that picks on jack <laughs> it's lights out i'm gonna get that phone call mr burke you need to come get luke why what happened yeah i know what happened and okay He's going out for ice cream with daddy because you never start a fight, but you always finish one, right? Great joy in Luke being a brother, Luke being compassionate for his brother, but at the same time, not letting him get away with anything. Right. Watching Luke try to skate and play hockey and learn hockey. I can't skate. I grew up in the city of Metro, Massachusetts. I've got four NHL players that I grew up with and my brother grew up with. I can't skate, John. But <laughs> Luke's like, I'm going to learn and I'm going to do well. And then he learns, he's playing lacrosse and it's just watching him is, is joyful. And Gracie is a pre-K person exploring her world and getting excited for kindergarten and just, you know, the joy that she brings to the family that, that most five-year-old little girls would, you can relate to. That's how, that's what I try and focus on. But I never forget. Sure. You know, NF, for the audience, John, for people who don't know, NF the one of the analogies I draw is the time is a ticking bomb. So you're in you're in a room and there's this big you know like right out of the cartoons right that big black bomb that round bomb that Wiley e. Coyote used to light a match right but there's a bomb in the corner tick 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 and it's there and the guy says that may never go off or it's going to go off any second and it follows you around everywhere you go. Right. When Jack got his diagnosed with his glioma. The bomb didn't go off. It just, the ticking got louder. Yeah, right. Tick, tick, tick. So we could live in that space and just, you know, hear the ticking all the time. And I'd be on this podcast with you on video going, and you'd be like, what's going on with this guy? But it gets muted by the joy. Yeah, that's right. It gets muted by the hope. But it doesn't go away. And it may never go off. And I might die with that bomb never going off, I might die with a cure. For, and we'd be talking about, we have to change the logo to cured, put a D on it. Cured NF with Jack, a big red D. That'll be a party, my That'll friend. That'll be a party. Uh, you'll want to be at that one. Yeah. So it may not, but we choose to live day to day with all elements of life and understand that on some days we have experiences that others don't yeah. and they're bad. But at the same time, we have experiences like front row that, you know, I would trade everything not to have that experience because Jack wouldn't be sick. But the fact that he is, and that's our reality, we get to experience joy and love and hope in ways that other families never do. And I think that's a gift that we are able to give. And one of the reasons why I share the good, the bad, and the not so good with our story is because I think that we allow people into our lives to experience the bad because it's important, but also to experience even firsthand if they if it's them or second or third hand that they read about what somebody else did for us and that's life for me um if i could though talking about jack i don't know how he does it john mm. i don't know how he finds the joy that he finds if people go to his facebook page kieran f with jack they'll see a photo of him sitting with his cousin may who's just a year old and he's in the middle of this huge guffaw like laughter and that's so him it's so him. And I don't understand how he does that. I don't know how he goes to school and works really hard despite some of the challenges he has and he excels and his teachers love him. Everybody loves Jack, right? I don't know how he has such joyful life that he sends out that message to people. You started at the top of the show here saying that, you know, you just, Jack's easy to love, right? I mean, he's a pain in the neck 11 year old, like a lot of them. Sure. Are, right? But, but in the greater view, I don't know how he does it. Imagine, you speak a lot in front of people, right? I do. Let me ask you this. So you get up to in front of an audience, I don't care if it's 10 or 10,000, 
and you're on the side, they're about to introduce you in, and you're ready to go in front of the mic, and what do you do? Do you check to see if your fly's up? I don't know. I do that. Because right? <laughs> so, I'm like, oh, my God. What if you came off one of your speeches, John, and, and you realized that your fly was down? You realized that people weren't so intrigued by what you were saying, but it's what was going on there. It's like, wow, right? Wow. So you've been... You've lived a life, so you've been down walking with your wife in the mall, and you're and you're like, why are people? I know she's pretty cute, but why are people looking at my wife? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, they're not. Uh oh, yeah, yeah. My yep. fly is down. We've all had that experience. Think about this: you can't zip up your fly, mm. but you still have to go to the mall. Yeah, you have to go to the grocery store. You have to go to the restaurant. You have to go to the front row f- event. You have to go to the golf tournament. You have to be right. And in this society, you know, like it or not, we are judged and viewed by visual things, right? And Jack has that plexiform neurofibroma that makes him look a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And nothing he can do about that right now. Yeah. And you'd be amazed if you walked with him in the mall, you'd be amazed at what you would observe. And whether he doesn't notice it, um, like I do, but people just kind of look. Longer than the three seconds that you're allowed. Yeah. And I, I've done a pretty good job every time I get better at it of just swallowing all that. Like I don't, you know, kids get a free pass. If you're below junior high school, you get a free pass. But when you have a parent, a, a grown man or a grown woman doing, you know, this, I have a hard time with that. But he, I think he either doesn't notice it or he's done a better job than his father and probably many of us as adults dealing with that. Yeah. of being a little bit different. What advice would you give to parents or children, for that matter, on that subject of being different? And you know that my kids have interesting names and people, you know, we think about like as they grow up, what they will deal with regarding those names. Mm-hmm. And uh, what advice do you give to parents or kids on that subject of how you deal with that? Huh. Uh, the advice came from Jack. Love that. It did. It did. And it hit me right between the eyes. He was four or five years old. We're at McDonald's. And this older gentleman comes up and he looks at, looks at me, looks at Jack, and he says, he wasn't an evil guy. He wasn't sure. a bad guy. What's wrong with your eye? Quote, unquote. Yeah. And Jack pretended, I think, that he didn't hear him. And I kind of just kind of looked at him. I didn't say anything. And he, and he said it again. He looks at Jack and goes, what's wrong with your eye? And Jack hesitated. He didn't say anything. Because again, he's five years old. Sure. And I said, oh, he bumped his eye on the kitchen table. Oh, geez, I hope you're all right. Oh, thank you, sir. We got our McDonald's breakfast because I'm a big spender. We sat down in the chair. I'm, I'm deep in probably my third English Egg McMuffin. And he says, Daddy. I said, yeah. He said, why did you lie to that man? Whoa. <laughs> I, said, I said, what? He said, why did you lie to that man? You told him I bumped my eye. I have a tumor. And I said, I don't know. I don't know. But I'll never do it again. And upon reflection, I realized that I was protecting the adult and not advocating for my son. Mm. And not only for him, but for other kids, kids in wheelchairs, kids in kids who have other issues visually or what have you. I I caved in to some guy I don't know and I couldn't give a shit less about. I wanted to make him feel okay about asking about my son. What's wrong with me? And my five-year-old basically said, what's wrong with you? Are you with me or are you not? And I took that, to, it's obviously been, it's been six years. And so to your question about advice on that, I, I just don't protect the people that don't need the protecting. Protect the people that do. And when... If your son or daughter or your family member or your friend has a difference that they're struggling with, all you can do is advocate for them. And it's easier, I think, in some ways, if it's an adult. But if it's a young child that doesn't understand, why were they making fun of my name? What's wrong with my name, Dad? Well, you know, you can't say, well, because people suck. You got to understand that, you know, your name is fine. You know, your name is part of who you are. You know, with Jack, it's like, I, don't, I didn't have to have this dialogue with him. He knows. And he's been handling it like that since he's five. So he's taught me how to be. And that's just pretty crazy, right? 
It's going to be from it. That's on his mother's side, I think. That's from him. <laughs> that's from Beth. She's she's the one with the grace and the and the dignity, and so that's that's where he gets that from, I think. You know, I can relate to this idea of protecting because uh, we were at the uh, park a couple years ago, and Tiger wanted to climb this rock wall, and I didn't think he was old enough to do it. I didn't think he would be able to make it up the wall, and I was just really protecting. I was protecting him in my mind. I was protecting the seven dollars it would have cost to have him harness up, put his hand on the wall, and then walk away. Um, you know, and that sounds silly, but that's what was going through my mind. And eventually he talked me into giving him a try. And so he jumped up on the wall and he flew all the way up this wall, like 30 feet up on the wall. <laughs> and he got to this part on the wall where it inverts out. And I just, I remember saying to myself, there's no way that right. he's going to make it past that part. He's four at the time. He's four. Right. So he, sure enough, in that moment, he gets to the part where it starts to invert out. And he says to me, he looks down from the top of the wall and he's like, he goes, Papa. I can't. Yeah. And I look back up and I went, it's okay, buddy. You tried. And yeah. then right then the, I thought I was being like, Hey, good job. You tried. Like, you know, that was good. Sure. And the guy, so he started to let go of the wall, but right then the guy who was working at the rock wall, mm -hmm. uh, he turned to me and he said, uh, I think your boy could do it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and he looks back up at my son and goes, Hey, little man, try again, you know? And, and Tiger, with this newfound confidence, not from his father, but from the guy working at the rock wall, grabs the wall, climbs to the very top, smashes the button, and the lights go off. And, oh, man, I was both excited and felt like the worst dad in the entire world. Right. Um, right. And, and what I realized when I walked away was that it's also easy to treat somebody like we remember them yesterday. Uh -huh. versus who they've become today and the type of person that doesn't maybe need our protection but needs more of an encouragement and a support and a you got this yeah like let's just let's go after it and not being afraid of the failure piece so i relate to that a lot man i relate so let's uh let's do this i, I want to spend a few minutes and talk about the day itself sure you know jack's day his front row experience can you speak to that a little bit what was that yeah. day like what was it like for your family what was it like for jack well, it was pretty incredible. You know, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, sometimes we don't sleep the night before the MRI because of the anxiety, right? But the night before the front row thing, I really couldn't sleep. And it was a very good thing, right? It's for this, like, I'm like, wow, what's going to go on? And I mean, Helen was great. You know, we knew in general, but we didn't know. We didn't yeah. know the specifics. We didn't know that Jay Lodge was going to be there and Gossamer the Magician and, and Dan Black and all. Oh, so it was, it was really exciting. So everybody got up early. We didn't have to set the alarms for the kids even. Uh, that morning That's and getting great. up and getting to the airport. And I remember talking to Helen because I'm an idiot. I'm like, so do we go to the airport? So we'll drive to the airport. And she's like, are you? No, you don't do anything. You just show up. The car is going to pick you up. And I know she got frustrated with me like, wow, he just doesn't get it. Um, <laughs> it's not the first time in our relationship that uh, that she thought that. We've been friends for too long. And just, you know, being treated like, you know, you're something special was great for, for all of us. And you know, getting on the airplane, I mean, that's always a cool thing for kids, I think. I mean, Jack's flown for his whole life because our family's in Boston. We traveled a lot with our kids to go see relatives. But, you know, Gracie was all about window seat. And, of course, you know, it didn't take him but five minutes to start fighting. So that's not on the video. Of, uh, <laughs> we left that out. Of front row. We we'll leave that part out. Of, eh, stop touching me. You know, all that. I'm unfamiliar with that. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, you have no idea, right? Yeah, I know parents on this uh, who are listening to this are like, wow, that never happens at our house. And then just getting to Myrtle Beach and just having no idea, you know, Callie Monroe was the coordinator, right? She's amazing. You know, she's one of those few people that are, I mean, she's absolutely stunning, right? She's a stunningly beautiful woman, but even more so on the inside. And I mean, we're friends now and she's a mom and it's just incredible. She's a great lady and her husband is terrific. And Angela Wolf, who was just you know, giving of herself. It's not easy to, it's like videotaping cats, right? Yeah. When you're, you get three kids running around crazy and she <laughs> captured, as anybody who's seen the film from that day, captured the moment so eloquently and, and wonderfully. She was in it, but not in it, you know, yeah, that's right. great person. So we meet all these folks and the limo guy, you know, he was great. Everybody who touched us that weekend, right, mm -hmm. was just wonderful. And then we get to the hotel and Jay Lodge is there, he, you know, for the folks that don't know, he's the owner of the theater that was hosting the greatest magic show on, on earth. And he showed up 
like not just to say hi how are you right i don't know if you know this guy or not john no, but no, no. oh my goodness i mean he shows up with bags full of stuff you oh, know cool. all the stuff you can buy at the show like the plastic swords and all this stuff that would cost me like you know three hundred dollars right <laughs> i guy, remember hearing about this yeah he was like my favorite guy because he saved me like 300 bucks right but but a really really cool <laughs> we'll send him guy. this show let him listen to this he knows i told him a million times on facebook but i think he's a, i think he's originally from ireland if i uh, oh, cool. or england if I remember correctly, he and his wife are great people and just made us feel great. And, was, and then that was in the middle of the day. Like we got to the hotel and he's there. And then he goes like, poof, he's gone. I'm like, all right, what's going on there? And Helen's cracking up because she knows I'm a little bit of a control freak and I don't know what's going on. So, and she's loving that. Yeah. Then we went to lunch. They set up lunch. We walked over to the Hard Rock Cafe and it was like the Hard Rock seemed like it was open for us. Right. right? And the waitress was great, and we sit down and, and whatever you want. And the whole staff came out and they did a front row photo with us, and it was it was cool. It was like, you know, and the kids walked around. It's like, oh, who the Beatles. I'm like, oh, don't ask me that. Like, you don't know who the Beatles are. You know, Jimmy, who's Jimmy Hendrix? He looks funny. Right. I'm like, oh my God, these guys are rock gods. Stop it. Um, we, you know, and they're looking for the boy bands. You know, I'm like, oh. Taylor Swift, where's Taylor Swift? Not yet. She'll be there, but she's not there yet. Looking for our buddy uh, Kevin Griffin from Better Than Ezra to see if he was on the wall. He's a great guy. But uh, then for me, I don't know if Helen did this intentionally or if this happens at other events or not, but the Myrtle Beach Fire Department is outside in the parking lot of Hard Rock with the ladder truck and an engine and 15 burly muscle fire it right and i'm like what's this all about and they were part of the gig right they they pull out all the stops for jack and for luke and for grace and they gear them up with the fire equipment and get them up on the 100 foot ladder and shaking hands taking pictures and just incredible guys right and i don't know if you know this but my father was a firefighter no i didn't know yeah 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 so oh, um wow yeah so we lost him 10 years ago i'm sorry yeah, so he knew Jack. He was he Jack was a year old when he passed. So he he knew Jack. Didn't know Luke or Grace, but they know him. Uh, we keep him we keep him close to our family. I have actually the most prized possession other than my my family. You know, they say, "What do you do in a fire in your house? What do you take?" Right? People say photo albums and a whole bunch of different things. I've got his helmet. I've got his firefighter's oh, wow. helmet, and so they 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 know all about him. But. I want, I'm like, these guys, this fire guys, firemen. I wonder if Helen did that on purpose or not. Um, I don't, I never asked her that, but I was overcome with just that, you know, then the wow. connection to my father. And it was like, wow. And, the, and we had a blast. And so they did their thing. And then we went, we went back to the hotel and we did a little bit of talking to Helen and uh, about what's going on with Jack and filmed a little bit of the video. And then we went to the magic show, right? But before that, before that, we went to get pizza at Mellow Mushroom, and they had the sign out in front, welcome to Myrtle Beach, Jack Burke. And he thought that that was the greatest thing. Like he was Frank Sinatra <laughs> or Elvis Presley, like his names yeah. and lights. And, and it was really cool. And it's they a got big that, moment. Well, yeah, you know, Mellow Mushroom, man, right? And yeah. he's got that iconic photo of him in the front row in, in front of the sign. And they let him go watch, make pizzas. We had pizza and all that stuff. And then the magic show was just incredible. I mean, the, the coup de gras, right, is here we are, the front row. We walk in and... We get escorted in past all the little people, right? And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's the big, they have this big candy bar thing and it's where you can get all sorts of different candy. And, and Jay was there and he's, have at it. They could get it whatever they wanted. It was literally kid in a candy store. I've heard that phrase a million times, John. Front row actually delivered it. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. And to the point where we're like, all right, kids, cut it out, you know? Yeah. And then boom, to the front row. I'm not sure. I can't. I can't say this. I don't think I've. I've been to the front row once in my life. Mm. So this was really the first time, and I'm in the front row with with the kids and with Helen and stuff. And the magic show was incredible. You know, they obviously interacted with Jack and with Luke as well. You know, Dan Black, one of the guys, one of the performers, came down and shook hands, and it was just really, really exceptional. They 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 brought Jack into the show a little bit, and then. Post show, we met with all the performers and they acted like they knew Jack forever, right? And it was just unbelievable. And there's that, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I hate to admit it because I've done so many of my own events. I've had photographers to capture so many different events with Cured F with Jack, but the iconic photo of Jack Burke for me is the one we talked about. Um, you brought it up. Yeah. He's like this, right? 
yeah, it was black and white. Mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And Helen Brown took that photo, I think. And that said it all about what we're talking about today. Yeah. About joy and living in the moment and forgetting that, you know, in three days, he's got to go get a needle again to get chemotherapy. He, for that moment, and for many more during that weekend, we all were like, just done. Front row, mission accomplished, right? It was unbelievable. And then, you know, Jay Lodge decides to, oh, well, not only am I hosting you here, but here's a couple of tickets to go on a helicopter ride. What? Yeah, next day, let's go on a helicopter ride. And there's a picture of Jack in the helicopter and a picture of Luke in the helicopter. I... And I'll tell you what, this is the only downside of the Front Row Foundation, so take copious notes here. I was scared <laughs> out of my mind. I, I mean, I don't like going on Ferris wheels, John. And the kids the kids know this, uh, they, and they, they beat me up about it all the time. Like, we were getting ready to go on the helicopter, and Luke, who at the time was seven, turns to me and he goes, you ready for this? <laughs> Are you ready for this? See, my seven-year-old is calling me out. That's right. Calling out yeah, my man. Yeah. And we did the helicopter ride. Thanks again to Jay Lodge for helping with that. And then we had tickets to this upside down house they have in Myrtle Beach. And it was just, you know, two days of awesomeness. Now, one of the things that you don't know, and it was a side thing, is that I posted on Facebook, hey, we're heading to our front row thing. We're going to Myrtle Beach, blah, blah, blah. Beth's best friend from college, Stephanie Asmus, who is a board member of Cure Enough Jack now, she texted me and she said, Chip and I and the kids are in Myrtle Beach this weekend. So we actually met up with That's awesome. her best friend and family. We hung out with them for a second night and the next day and all that. That's and great. So it was like it was like icing on the cake. And I was like, wait a minute, did Helen tell Stephanie that too? That would have been really incredible. Wow. Uh, but yeah, that was so we it, the day and the weekend, if you would, of the of the front row thing was just uh, was spectacular. And, and again, it goes back to celebrating the experience and living in the moment. And above all, is the hope that is weaved through your life. Yeah. And if you don't have that, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Oh man. My face is uh, hurting right now from smiling so much. <laughs> like this just brings me so much joy. I really, I thank you for sharing the story and I encourage if somebody's listening to this and you haven't seen the video or go read this, you know, read Jack's story on our website to go do that because the pictures do, they are worth a thousand words. Really and that are. one photograph you're talking about, I've referenced, I think maybe uh, the greatest photograph ever taken in the last 10 years, I think because of what it captures, the essence, the, the message that is portrayed in that photograph is just outstanding. Yeah. A couple of things I want to bring up. One, since we're talking about interesting coincidences or occurrences, yeah. You know, your friends showing up in Myrtle Beach and all these cool things. I should let you know, and this is something you don't know, uh -oh. that a week before <laughs> we started Front Row Foundation, with we did this, um, this run to raise money. This was November 13th, 2005. Okay. A week before that, I got a group of guys together. Uh, it was probably like 10 guys, and I called it the Front Row Group. And this was a group of guys that we wanted to live big and give big. We didn't want to be the type of guys that would spend the first 60 years of our lives figuring out how to make millions, millions. of dollars and be so full of our own stuff that we would then go, now that I am so satiated, I've eaten everything, I've owned every toy, I've done everything for me that I could possibly do. Yeah. Now I'm going to go find a way to give away some money. Mm -hmm. That we said, how could we be a group of guys that earns money and, and achieves and does things that we love to do in life, mm -hmm. but we give along the way. This becomes a partnership with contribution, a partnership with charity, a partnership with giving. How yeah. can we do both it, you know, with equal passion? And that was a week before the Front Row Foundation began. And well, for the week before, by the way, the Front Row Foundation run, where we officially raised the money and, and uh, kind of kicked things kicked off. off. Yeah. So that all started in Myrtle Beach. Um, that right, which is really fun to think about how then a short while later, you know, you were almost to the month, you were back there. And that's really exciting. Wow. I did not know that. I did not know that. So that's cool. The second thing I want to illuminate here, Jake, because, and this has just been so great. And there's so many wonderful ideas that you've shared. And I think we can all learn so much through your story and the real life struggle and how you've been able to take action and to bring hope and light to your situation and to still live 
in spite of the challenges that you face. And you said something earlier about it's not that the challenge goes away. It's that, and I, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I recall you saying was something about muting it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I think that what we do in life sometimes is we crowd out the bad by putting in more good that it's hard to hold two thoughts at once. So if you can hold something that is optimistic or positive or hopeful, if you can hold something where you appreciate or have gratitude, then it tends to mute out the thing that wants to dominate, the ticking, right? Yes. That wants yes. to dominate your day. And, it, and it's not about ignoring that it's there or uh, not being real. It's about understanding what it's like to mute something out. And, you know, I remember, it's so funny, it just came to me. As a kid, one of my first cars was a Jeep CJ7, like this <laughs> green Jeep CJ7, this old, it was like 1980 something. And it had a lot of rattles, you know, it had a lot of, a lot of ticks and a lot of, you know, buzzing, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And my, my solution to that was a louder radio. That was it. I was yep. like, oh, yeah. I would I'd get people in my car. I'm like, you hear all those, all those rattles? Watch this. And I turn up the radio. I'm like, there's no more rattles. It all right. goes away. Right. Yeah, just blast uh, Detroit Rock City from Kiss or something like that. And right. That's it. Right. It just goes away. Right. That's my solution because uh, I couldn't <laughs> afford another solution. But I think that what we do, and I think you've really helped me to, to realize this, is that what the charity wants to do is to mute out the pain or what's wrong or the challenge, to mute that. Um, because we can't always find a cure, but we can mute that by amplifying what's good about life, by amplifying what works or what's, what we can do. Yep. And I think that that's, that's something powerful. It's like, don't ask what you can't do, but ask what you can do. And that's, that's, I think, what we're all trying to do. And I think that's what you're doing with your charity, with, you know, Cure NF with Jack. I think that what we're asking is, what can we do? Can you speak to that a little bit as kind of our final piece here about what are your thoughts about what people can do today? Like when they are done with this podcast episode, what action do we want them to take, Jake? Like what do we want people to go do in the world after they listen to this today? That's a great question, John. I, and I, I, before I answer that, I want to say that I really like that. And we didn't talk about this, but I like this whole mute situation, mute and then illuminate with the good, understanding that we can never pretend that it's not there. That's not what it's all about. But if we can just turn up the volume of the good for a little bit, and that's what you do, and we can't solve everything. And I hope that we cure NF. And I believe in my heart and my soul that we will do that. But you well know that you know, Jack's one of the fortunate ones that has had a front row experience uh, and is still here to talk about it. You know, there, there are wonderful people that you've helped that I see because I follow what you guys do that, you know, that didn't, make, that didn't make it. And I love the fact that you celebrate their lives and recognize that they had a battle and, and that um, it wasn't just about that event, but you keep them going. So I wanted to, that's part of the illumination of that is recognizing they had a, a wonderful life and they had a challenge and they were impactful and we brought you front row brought joy to them that that day and uh it's just a wonderful thing so what do i want people to do after they if they're still hanging in listening to to this right something do something it, it, it doesn't have to be as 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 dramatic as maybe what you've done or what i've done and you know you get your 10 buddies and you know go on go on a weekend down to myrtle beach and change the and in your way change the world and impact lives not everybody has to say you know i'm going to create a, a foundation and a 501c3 and a board and i'm going to call it cure enough with jack I'm, you don't have to do that you can do that and i know that you can do that because i did it and with my wife and with many of our friends, but you don't have to do that. But what you can't do, and maybe this is a little twist on your question, I apologize. You can't do nothing. It's your obligation to live, particularly if you live in this country where we have everything. I know there's struggles and this is probably, you know, a real t interesting time to talk about that. But as a whole, I don't think anybody, whether you, you're politically affiliated one way or the other, can disagree with the fact that we have a pretty good country here. And you live more than likely in a pretty good community and the vast majority of people listening to this. You just can't do nothing. If you have a coworker that has a son or a daughter that has something and you know about it, you got to do something. What is that something? I'll bring it back to time, talent, or treasure. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what not to do. Don't do nothing. So what's that mean? 
run a race because they're having a race for the kid's affliction or write a check or take somebody to lunch because you know that their son had chemo this week and you, hey, you got a minute, let's go out for a beer. That's something. But to do nothing is probably the worst thing that you can do as a person. And I don't understand. I'll never understand it. I don't claim to be this wonderful person. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm not. I have my faults too. But for me, I guess what Cure and Effigec has allowed me to do and understand not only for us, but for other charities and other causes that we are involved in out there is that the biggest sin and the worst thing you can do is nothing. So when you finish listening to this today, you know somebody out there in your community within one degree or two degrees of separation that need your help, that you can help their need. And you know how to do it. It's just a matter of whether or not they're going to do it. And it's up to you. It's up to you whether you're going to or not. There's time, there's talent, and there's treasure. And uh, one of the things I tell people is that it's this whole degree of separation thing. You know, for Jack in particular, and for NF, neurofibromatosis, this might be the first time that your listeners are hearing about neurofibromatosis or NF, but I guarantee everybody on this call knows somebody that has it within six degrees of separation, that whole sure. Kevin Bacon thing. Yeah. I'll tell you, when Jack did that uh, corporate speaking engagement, which I love saying because he was 10 years old and that cracks me up, I said that at the end, I was speaking with him at the end, I said to these guys, within six degrees of separation, you'll know somebody else that has NF. And I said, does anybody in the room know somebody right now? No hands go up. Five hours later, I meet my buddy who coordinated all this back at the hotel bar to, to say hello and have a beer or whatever. And he met me at the lobby. He said, Jake, you got to come here. And I'm like, What's the matter? He goes, you got to meet my colleague, Bill. I don't, I don't remember his name exactly, right? I'm like, all right, everything all right? He goes, you're going to decide. I said, okay. And the guy gets off his chair. He's at the bar. He gets off the chair. He comes over. He says, Jake, your son was amazing today. And I said, well, thanks. I said, it's his mother. You know, I do that whole thing, right? I said, it's his mother. It's true, it is. I said, thank you. And he said, but no, this is the thing. I went upstairs to rest, and I called my wife, and I said, I met this little boy today, and he has this disease called neurofibromatosis or something like that. And it was just amazing. I can't believe it. I've never heard of it. And his wife says, Bill, my brother has that. Oh, wow. And he said that. To, I said, are you kidding me? And I made a, I made a joke about it because that's what I tend to do is my defense mechanism is self-deprecation and, and humor. And I said, wait a minute. Your brother-in-law has NF and you don't know it? What kind of brother-in-law are you? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, the family just never talked about it. Right, right. And I said, well, I wish him well. Thanks very much. And he went on his way. And Kevin, my friend Kevin Andrews from college who coordinated all this, he goes, I just thought you were throwing some Medford Irish bullshit up there about the six degree thing. I said, well, there you go. I'm not. And so bringing that back, six degrees, you know, you're going to know somebody. We're all connected. Maybe with NF. But most importantly, you know somebody that needs help. That's right. You can help them. That's just right. do that. Do something. Everybody, what I say earlier, John, everybody can do a lemonade stand. Anybody can do that. Yeah. All right. Do something. Yeah. Do something. If people are listening and they want to get connected to you to learn more about Jack, of course, they can they can check out his story on our site. But uh, beyond that, where would they connect with you or find more about, uh, you know, curing NF with Jack? Sure. The, the best place to go is our website, you know, cure NF with Jack. Dot com. He has a Facebook page as well. There's over 3,000 followers on Jack's page, which I think is pretty cool. So cool. Twitter, he's at uh, Cure Enough with Jack on Twitter. Uh, you want to get in contact with me, it's real easy to do. It's just jake at cureenoughwithjack.com. And I check my emails. Um, you can also message me on the, on the website. If you live in, in the Atlanta area or you just want to get on an airplane, come down and meet Jack at, right. the, <laughs> at the golf tournament. I, I can tell you this, that no one's ever regretted meeting Jack. There's probably been a few people that's like, eh, I could have done without the old man. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but no one's ever regretted yeah. meeting Jack, and he loves it. That's cool. But that's the key place, John. Thank you for asking that. But cureenoughwithjack.com is where, where you want to be. Awesome. Well, I uh, I speak down in Atlanta or Georgia at least. Uh, I would say at least twice a year. Really? So I am definitely going to come connect with you all when I'm there next, and that would just be so much fun. I guarantee you, it would be some fun, man. So you tell me how much time you have, and we can do everything and nothing, and everything in between. So cool. that's that would great. Be really fun, That'd and be that great. would be such a blast. Uh, before we sign off and say goodbye, uh, w one last question. Um, sure. When it's the end. 
for you, whenever that time comes, and I hope it's very uh, in in the distance, a long <laughs> way off from now. Yeah. Um, what do you most want to be remembered for, Jake? I think I want to be most remembered for taking action and taking a risk to try and help people with NF. And mostly, of course, rooted in, I'm not trying to be selfish and saying it's rooted in helping Jack. You know, I don't know what it would say on the tombstone if that if that's where I end up. But I think that I would, you know, all the success that you can have, whether it's in work or whatever, at the end of the day, uh, I want to be remembered for that. You know, I've told people this, John, you know, Jack's only 11, but what happens when he turns as a man and he turns to me one night, maybe we're out having a beer, right? And he says, what'd you do? What do you mean? Well, what'd you do to help, help me with this NF thing? And if I don't say everything, then I'm saying nothing. So I want to be able to say everything I could. That's it. Wow. So let's fast forward to that place where Jack's grown up <laughs> and he's sitting around with his uh, brother and sister yeah. and they're listening to this podcast. Yeah. What do you want to say to your family when they're listening to this 20 years down the road? Oof. What do you want them to know about your family, about how you feel about them? Um, hard to put into words, right? Uh, that um, I live my life to try and be the best Jake Burke I could be for them. And that I'm proud of who they are and what they are and who they become. And they are the greatest gift in my life. Wonderful. Jake, thank you for opening up your heart, sharing today. Um, your family is very lucky to have you. We are lucky to have you as part of the Front Row family. Oh, I'm very blessed and, and pleased to know you, to thank Helen for introducing me to Front Row. And I've told you this off air, and I'll tell you again, I know you don't want to hear it necessarily, but uh, life-changing, world-changing, incredible things that you do with Front Row, John. And I tell everybody that, man, it's great. So thank you for allowing me to share your forum today. And I look forward to seeing you when you are in Atlanta. And uh, the first couple beers are on me. Oh, it's going to be great. And, and you know, I want to say to you also that I do believe this is team human and we're connected in a way that if I help you, I directly help my family because you're creating a world that my kids grow up in. Every time you host a tournament, every time you put your heart out there, every time you take a massive action, my kids feel that in some kind of way. And even if it's, even if it's the sixth degree, mm -hmm. uh, they feel it. And so um, thanks for... Thanks for stepping up and thanks for digging deep and, and going out and creating something that is making big waves. So thank you, John. Let's keep doing that together. We'll do. If I can serve you and, and Jack and your entire family in any way down the road, we'll do it. But uh, let's let this be the beginning of some great conversation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. Take thanks. care, my friend. All right, you too. Bye bye. That does it for today, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure to check out curenfwithjack.com. We'll link to all this in the show notes. Share today's episode with somebody that you think would benefit from it. And also thanks to everybody in the Front Row community for making these events possible for people like Jack and his family. I'll tell you that from our volunteers to our staff, to our donors, especially our monthly donors, our Front Row ambassadors, these are people that donate anywhere from from $10 up to $500 every single month. And it, you know, it's these ongoing regular donations that allow us to operate in the way that we do, to create these amazing experiences for people that really need them. And I think you could sense that the importance of the work that we do from the impact that it had on Jack and his family. And you know that, that the idea of bringing joy, amplifying what's good in times when we really need to silence what is not. So I want to thank you for your support. And if you feel moved today, if you feel, you know, like you want to help out and just like Jake said, you know, it's time, it's talents, it's treasures. We need to bring to the table that what we can. Some of you have the treasure, but you're, you don't have a lot of time. So maybe you could become a monthly donor today. Maybe some of you are like, Hey, I don't have much treasure, but I've got some time. So how can I help? And you can reach out to us through our website. 
or perhaps you're somebody that you have a particular talent that you'd like to bring to the table and you'd like to say, hey, I can do this. You know, a shout out to Stephen Christopher and the team at Sequus who built our website. They literally built this, you know, because they wanted to support Front Row Foundation. This is thousands of dollars to build this incredible website. And they did it because they wanted to help our organization. Check them out, by the way, if you want to build a website, S-E-E-Q-U-S. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. But I just want to tell you so many great people supporting Front Row Foundation. You can donate directly through our website, frontrowfoundation.org, and just support whatever organization it is, whatever way you can, just go out there, just like Jake was saying, and do do something. What you can't do is nothing. So today, take an action. Do something that at the end of the day, you'll be so proud of. And I want to say thank you for listening to this show. Thanks for supporting the front row. I'm excited because this is just the beginning. Until next time, everybody, keep living your life in the front row. That's all for this episode of The Front Row Factor. To discover more simple and effective ways to lead a fearless front row life, visit frontrowfactor.com and subscribe to John's 4 Minutes in the Front Row, where he shares quick stories from real-life experiences. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope our show inspires you to live big, give big, and experience life to the fullest. See you next week on The Front Row Factor. Factor.